All righty. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, we are um, really happy to have you join us uh, to meet some of the new faculty in the arts and humanities at OSU. So um, I will do some really quick introducing of myself in the center, and then I'm going to let our speakers um, take over because that's really why you are all here. Um, so my name is Jennifer Borland. I am the director of the Center for the Humanities and I also teach in the art department. I teach art history. Um, and um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Center for the Humanities, um, Vera is going to toss uh, our um, website into the chat. Um, and uh, it is a place where you can find out more information about what we do. Um, we do programming, we have speakers, we have a um, very exciting uh, research group fellowship program, and um, we are happy to have you explore what's there and uh, let us know if you are interested or have questions about any of those events. We also encourage departments with relevant events to send those to us and we will put them on the website and try to share them in our bi-monthly, uh, usually bi-monthly um, newsletter and uh, sometimes through social media as well. So um, one of our goals is really to um, help uh, with the communication between people who have shared interests in the arts and humanities. Um, I think the other event that I would like to make sure everyone knows about is um, if you're curious and want to know more about our fellowship program, our current year fellows will be presenting their um, research proposals on April 17th. Um, and there's information about that on the website as well, but that is something that I want to make sure everyone knows about. Um, okay, and with that, I will tell you a little bit about our the kind of way we're going to do things today, and then I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. So um, I'm just going to introduce folks really quickly. They're going to have... Um, five to seven minutes or so uh, to share their research. And maybe they also talk a little bit about their teaching or other things. Um, and then uh, probably we'll have some time at the end to ask questions if you have them. Um, but of course you can also make note of somebody's name and uh, you can reach out to them individually as well. So hopefully the purpose of these events really is twofold, partly to help all of us at OSU get to know um, people who have joined the faculty recently and, and know what research you're doing. But we also wanna foster a community where new faculty feel um, welcomed and connected to um, people with shared interests. So it has kind of that twofold air, uh, Twofold purpose, I guess, if you will. Um, okay, so I think with that, we're gonna get rolling. And our first speaker is Tywo Bello from the history department. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to present my research. And it's nice to see everyone here today. Uh, can I quickly share my slides? My PowerPoint? Okay. You should be able to. Is that working for you? Yes, I, yeah, I okay, think so. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, my name is Taiwo Pelo. Uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of History at Oklahoma State University. I obtained my PhD uh, from the University of Toronto in 2022. Uh, also in history, uh, but currently I'm finishing my postdoc uh, where I'm working uh, at the intersection of African African history and African diaspora uh, history, looking at uh, the experiences of Africans who came to Canada and the United States uh, in the 20th century. So to move uh, very quickly, I would like to talk about just to for people to know the areas of my research interest. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in women's and gender history. I do work on violence and war. I'm interested in African political history. I have, I've also uh, done some work in the areas of humanitarianism and NG histories of NGOs, as well as human rights and social justice. I'm also interested in global and transnational history. I'm interested in you know, history of crimes, as well as uh, black, black diaspora and migration histories, and lastly, I'm interested in border security security studies. So 
uh, if there's anyone here or in the room who is working in any of these areas, I will be happy to, to be in touch and collaborate with them. Uh, Okay. Excuse me, one second. So to speak about, about my current research, uh, at the University of Toronto, where I obtained my PhD, I did my dissertation. My dissertation focused on uh, the how the violence between the Nigerian government and the Biafran government during the Nigerian Civil War which was a war that broke out between 1967 and 1970, shaped the everyday life or experiences of women in Biafra and how women responded to that, to that uh, conflict. Uh, so now this, the title that I have up here is not, is not the actual title of my, of my dissertation because I've revised it uh, since I defended the dissertation. So this title that we have here, Biafran Women, Gender, Blockade, Violence, and Resistance during the Nigerian Civil War, 1967 to 1970, is actually uh, the title of my current uh, book project, which is under, uh, under contract uh, with Ohio University Press. Uh, so the question that I'm looking at or trying to understand uh, in this book or to explore in this book is what 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 were the wartime wartime contributions of women to that very conflict? Uh, some of the existing uh, literature or studies have argued that uh, the survival of women and children in the civil war uh, was actually dependent on the the contributions made in that war by all yeah on the contributions or the efforts of uh, uh, organizations such as the the uh, say uh, international organizations, uh, including the Joint Church Aid, uh, uh, the Red Cross, and other other core uh, big organizations, including UNICEF and the likes. So that then, in my in my in a sense, that that takes away the agency of women, and uh, most of those scholars have used pictures like this like, that you can see on the screen to justify their argument or to portray their argument. But my research by interviewing um, women in Biafra, where the war eventually broke out, I realized that women played very key role. In short, their survival was based on their own personal, individual, and collective efforts, not based on the efforts of international or global uh, international organizations like that. So women offered during the war, you know, food, sex, uh, technological, medical, and emotional support to Biafran soldiers. Uh, as a result, we cannot understand why the war dragged for close to 30 months that it did, or how the Biafran soldiers were able to withstand the firepower of the Nigerian, Nigerian soldiers without factoring into consideration or without considering the, the roles that women played in that war. That's one of the key uh, findings of my research. I will quickly move on from, from there. So that in case anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to respond. Uh, so having mentioned that one, I, I, I just completed another, another book manuscript uh, which is focusing on, on how the crimes involving Nigerians in Nigeria, as well as in diaspora, shaped the Nigerian society and the, the societies in diaspora. So when I think about diaspora, I'm thinking about the United States, uh, with Nigerians who were involved in drug trafficking. Uh, I'm also thinking about Great Britain. I'm also thinking about India. So I use these three, uh, three countries uh, as, as case studies for the diaspora aspects of the book. Uh, but the other aspect focused on the local incidents of crimes in, in Nigeria. So the title is A Place to Die, Crime, Law, and Punishment in Nigeria and the Diaspora. So I'm trying to understand how the uh, 
criminal activities of Nigeria has shaped the societies in the society in Nigeria as well as the society in the diaspora, as I mentioned, as well as the punishment that those uh, uh, incidents or developments attracted. So I just completed this. I just sent out a book proposal for it to a university press. I haven't heard back from that, but it's it's under work. Oh, sorry. So here's a third a third book manuscript which I just completed as well. And and what this looks at, it's titled uh, "The Brick Brother." Nigeria's interventions in wars, violence, and decolonization struggles in Africa. And what I'm trying to understand here is, or what I'm what I'm trying to put forward here is the efforts of Nigerian government or the Nigerian federal government in decolonizing uh, some of these countries that are listed here: uh, Rhodesia, South Africa, uh, Southwest Africa, today's Namibia, Mozambique, and Angola. And one of the core arguments that I'm making is that we cannot have an understanding of how these countries gained their independence without recognizing the roles that Nigeria actually played in, in all of that. Then a penultimate slide. This is my current project now uh, that I'm working on. Uh, it's titled The Refuge, uh, Liberation Wars and the Making of African and Palestinian Refugees in Nigeria, 1960s to 1990s. And what, what I'm trying to understand here, what I'm trying to explore in this is uh, what were the experiences of the Namibian, South African, Zimbabwean, and Palestinian refugees in Nigeria within this period? And how did they contribute to uh, economic, social, political, as well as cultural development in, in Nigeria within the 1960s and, and, and 1990s. I haven't uh, really started this research. I'm, think, I'm still thinking through uh, my research questions. I'm still thinking through where I, I would get uh, you know, materials and the likes. Yeah, so it's still uh, at an infant uh, stage, I would say. Uh, but this is my current research uh, project that I'm working on. And in terms of teaching, I have mentioned in the beginning, I mean, the the areas where I'm interested in. And then um, looking at my teaching, I mean, you could see, I mean, looking at these courses that I've listed here, I mean, you could see that, yes, I mean, truly there's, 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 there's an intersection between the research that I do as well as the teaching uh, that I also do as well. Uh, so the first, the first one, Gender Violence and Genocide from Global Perspective is a course that I'll be offering uh, sometime in the fall uh, this year. But this one, it's an undergraduate course. The first one is an undergraduate course. The second one, Topics in War, Violence, and Conflict in Africa, is a course that I hope to offer in the future. Uh, and it's going to be a, a graduate uh, seminar, maybe in the next year or the next two years. Or like, I hope to be able to offer this class. Thank you very much. That's all I've got. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. If you can stop, perfect, yep. All right, um, so I am going to move on to our next speaker, who is Chris Blake Turner from Philosophy. Hi everyone, let me just share my screen as well. Uh, hopefully you can see all that, uh, great. Uh, so thanks, uh, Jennifer and, and Vera as well for organizing this. It's really great to hear about everyone's research and to see some uh, faces from the new faculty orientation as well as meet some new people as well. I'm going to focus mostly on my research, though I've got super deep commitments to teaching and making philosophy accessible to everyone. But just to keep things manageable, I'm going to focus on the research here. If you want to ask me about teaching later, please do. As you might have detected from my voice, I'm originally not from around here. I'm originally from Britain. Uh, and I came over here in 2015 to do a PhD at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I graduated in 2021, and after a couple of years in uh, Alabama, I, I took up my position here in the philosophy department in August, which I've been really happy about. So I want to start by telling you about my main research focus, which is on the foundations of reasoning and rationality, which maybe sounds abstruse and grandiose, but let's try and break it down a little bit. So 
some things that we humans do are rationally valuable, not in the sense that they're, that they're very rational, but they're the kinds of things that can be more or less rational. So for example, my eating a burrito might be more or less rational. You might have a better or worse reason for doing it. In fact, it's hard to imagine there being bad reasons for eating burritos, but maybe, maybe there are such cases. Whereas my digesting the burrito is irrational. It's not something that I can do more or less rationally, even though that's something that I sort of do in some sense. It's not that I can have better or worse reasons for doing it. It's just, just something that I do. And I'm interested in this distinction between what's rationally valuable and what's irrational also in our mental lives. So for instance, you might perform a piece of reasoning. You might say, well, Socrates is a human, all humans are mortal. Therefore, Socrates maybe should have thought harder before going to town on that hemlock. And whatever you think about that inference, whether it's a good or a bad piece of reasoning, it's clearly the kind of thing that can be more or less rational. Whereas I'm realizing, I'm about to realize that, well, I am realizing that I've got a lot of food related examples and that's probably bad given the timing, but you know, bear with me, we'll be done soon. Suppose you see a picture of a delicious chocolatey dessert and that causes your stomach to rumble and that causes you to think, oh, I should go and get lunch. That's like sort of a process involving your mental states, but it's just a causal associative process. It's not more or less rational. And so in general, then I'm interested in what is it for agents like us predominantly, but maybe also other kinds of agents too, animals or non-human agents that we haven't thought of yet. What is it for agents like us to engage in rationally valuable action and, and mental action? And, you know, one of those things is mental action. We're thinking about reasoning, processes of inference. I'm interested in what good reasoning is. And... Uh, some of my work thinks about how we can use formal tools like symbolic logic to help us answer those kinds of questions. So that's maybe like the core of my research, but I want to say a little bit about something else I'm really passionate about in research, and that's this sort of philosophical applied upshot. I'm really interested in using philosophical tools and ideas to shed light on areas of immediate practical importance, where the theoretical rubber meets the practical road. So I just want to give you two quick examples of, of some work that I've been doing that fits that brief. First up, I've, I've thought a little bit about fake news. Um, I've applied lessons from external world skepticism to the problem of fake news. So external world skepticism is this very radical idea that maybe we don't really know anything um, very much outside our heads. There's various ways to motivate this, but my favorite, given that I'm a millennial, is thinking about the matrix. You know, maybe you're sort of plugged into some machine that's simulating all your experiences and it looks like everything, including this experience as of having, uh, talking about this to all of you, is not actually happening. It's just sort of some kind of fake uh, process of my, uh, fake input to my, my, my cognitive system. That's an interesting and like really old and ancient philosophical problem, uh, but I was interested in taking some lessons that have come out of that literature and applying to them to the problem of fake news. And the upshot is that, well, it's pessimistic. Fake news is bad, even if you don't believe it for certain reasons that we can get into if you want. But the, the sort of point is thinking about this kind of abstruse, May, merely maybe just sort of arcanely interesting philosophical problem, I think has real world importance in ways that uh, really excites me. One other kind of piece of work in this vein, this is work in progress. The title is tentatively the revolution will not be grammatical. Uh, it's applying lessons from the philosophy of language to think about how we might respond to pronoun skeptics. So the pronoun skeptic is a person who objects to using the singular they on various grounds, but one of which that's commonly heard, at least it is if you use the singular they, is that it's not grammatical. And there's a kind of move that people sometimes make, uh, often well-meaning, um, that I call the grammar move, which is to point out, well, actually the singular they is grammatical, Shakespeare and Austin and whoever you like used it. There's a nice example of the grammar move here from Corey Stamper, who's a lexicographer, she used to work I don't think she still does for Merriam Webster. She knows what she's talking about here. She says, happy to announce I'm offering a new fall class. Singular they is 700 years old. What is your problem, OMG? Which will consist of me standing on a desk yelling at you in mingle English, three credit hours. Okay, that's funny. And the grammar move can be useful in various contexts. But actually, I think that deploying it gives too much to the pronoun skeptic. And it sort of concedes the conversational uh, like foundations in their own terms that gender justice should depend in fundamental ways on what extant speakers find grammatical or not. And again, there's more to say there, but I just want to illustrate that general point of 
uh, partly what excites me is, is finding areas where philosophical tools can shed light on these pressing, important current problems. So I'm super interested in collaborating across disciplines um, on anything to do with anything I've talked about, but in particular reasoning, rationality or irrationality, or the topics where philosophical tools can shed light on applied issues. Um, or anything else you can think of. Uh, just, uh, yeah, if you're interested, reach out and uh, I'd love to get involved. Uh, I'll leave it there as I know we've got plenty of people to get through, but thanks very much. And uh, it's been it's been good to be with you today. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, okay, our next speaker is Joan Court, Corte? Court. Corte. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. In theater. So welcome. Hello. Hello. Great to see some of my old friends here and to meet new ones. Um, again, I'm Joan Cordy and I'm in the theater department. Uh, just a little bit of information before I start sharing a screen. I have been teaching in higher education for about 25 years now, and um, I've been at a small liberal arts university with a huge theater program. And so the, the focus of my life work in the last 25 years has been in the classroom and in, in dealing with the pedagogy, but also developing young artists and working. I teach acting, I direct, and I also do voice work. And a lot of it might also be dialects. And I have a special research in for, uh, interest in original pronunciation from Shakespeare. So Chris, I'd love to talk more about the evolution of language and how grammar and word use change and, and how we use that in theater as well. Um, my currency is in storytelling. And so what I do as an actor, what I, I do as a director, and what I do to collaborate with other people is to bring stories to life so that they can reach a broader audience. Um, the, the person who isn't going to go to the library and check out a book and read it, but wants to experience what's happening in the world. And theater is a, is a great vehicle for that. So I balanced my teaching life with my professional life as an actor and a director. And now I'm here at OSU, it's my first semester. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, I, I don't have a job booked on Broadway. I don't have a teaching book ready to be published. What have I been doing? And uh, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out where to park and the photocopier code. Oh my gosh. So I don't know if anybody else has been having some of these feelings, but I know I have. And uh, when I decided to be in this group today, I thought, mm, I need to get busy. What have I done? I've done nothing. Of course, that's the default. Um, so I went to talk to Dr. Christine Johnson, who's the Associate Vice President of Research at OSU. And oh, wow, she really kind of calmed me down and said, what you're doing with teaching has valid research components to it. Because since I've been here, I have redesigned and redeveloped the two performance curriculums for the BFA program. And uh, oh, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to share a screen. How's that sound? That sounds good. Otherwise, I'm getting out of my outline. Share. Okay. Does everyone see that? Okay, I don't know what you see and what you do. Do you get my whole desktop as well? I'm just curious. Um, no. it's it's looking good that we are getting the the slides on the side. Okay, super. It, that's not a big deal. Yeah. So, um, balancing teaching, administration, service, and research, but uh, those are the distractions. Sometimes I remember in orientation they said carve out time in your week and put it on your calendar and do that. And then I have someone knocking on my door. <laughs> so I have them in the best. But I have discovered that those distractions have been informing my research. And um, my research as a creative artist is um, a little different. So one of the things that I've already done here at OSU this semester is, or started last semester, is directing Ada and the Engine by Lauren Gunderson. No closed this past weekend. It is a play about Ada Byron Lovelace and the first computer. I'm not even going to say first woman computer. She was the first computer. Charles Babbage imagined the analytical engine and built models for it. And she's the one who figured out how to 
out how to program it. Um, so there was so much research involved with that. And part of that was what is the analytical engine and what were the drawings and taking those concrete vision or, or concrete things that happen and then mixing them as a, as a creative artist with the inspiration images, um, dealing with binary code and also the, the Crystal Palace. It was the time of the Industrial Revolution and all of this happening in England in that time period. And saying, so how do we bring that story to the stage? I don't have a great picture of the stage, but you can see by the curved gears as they were on the floor that that was to represent the drawings and then we, of course we have a a shout out here a reference to the machine itself with the slatted back um, background with that part of the ADA in the engine was to collaborate with um, other STEM or STEAM professors and we did uh, a panel about women in the STEM professions and in also in the arts and how to keep the the dial moving forward to reach you know human equality in those areas and it was really interesting to meet with mathematics professors and someone from the college of engineering and the college of architecture and to just collaborate in that way um, as far as my other creative research i'm i'm an actor by trade and um, i work with a company out of dallas texas and we are in the we are currently developing a production of King Lear, it's just really focusing on the text and doing the research with Shakespeare. This is from Romeo and Juliet, I'm sorry, because we haven't done King Lear yet. And uh, hopefully be playing, um, we're still negotiating things, I'm, I'm part of the company, but uh, I'll probably be playing Kent, which is Lear's uh, advisor. And also typically a role played by a man and to now take this and put a, a feminine and what I would consider a more maternal kind of uh, relationship with King Lear in that. I also work with a company out of theater, Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, sorry, ha ha, happy finger on the mouse. Um, it's a, this was a production that I'd done with Theater Midwest in the past, but what I'm developing right now is a one person show called The Gull by Zachary Cohn. And uh, it's a one person retelling of The Seagull and um, so I'm doing a lot of things with Chekhov. I also teach, and so that we get the intersectionality, a class on acting Chekhov and dealing with realism movements in theater so that the actors can come from a basis of truth in their performances. And eventually the next step after this is to write a companion piece that focuses on Olga Knipper, Chekhov's wife, who is also an actor in the company, so that to tell her story because so many times it's about Chekhov and so to also talk about Olga. Um, creative research in the arts or at least in the theater is usually evaluated by outside reviewers, theater critics or peer reviews for other performing artists and um, I'm also I mentioned the curriculum changes that I've been working on and the research that I've done with peer and aspirational institutions and uh, I'm planning on writing a, an article about program development for BFA programs and sharing that in higher ed journals because um, I have a very immersive, um, active learning approach to scaffolding the different learning outcomes for the degree program so that when the OSU students graduate, they will be ready to hit the ground running and start working in their profession. I think I probably talked really fast, but I'm done unless anyone has any questions. I think we'll probably hold off questions um, okay. until, until the end, um, but thank you so much, Joan. All right, let me see, I'm gonna remove my pin. Um, okay, um, and I just have to say that I think doing, doing research into pedagogy in your field is very much research and something that uh, is really um, an important kind of research to be doing. So um, yeah, I love that, that you're thinking about working on on that kind of um, research as well as, as all the other things that you shared with us. Um, okay, I am gonna turn it over now to Ben Murphy, who is a um, member of the Art, Graphic Design and Art History Department. All right, thank you. Let's see. All 
All right. Um, well, it's good to see everyone. Um, some uh, old friends that I haven't seen seen in in a few months, um, and some new faces. Uh, so again, my my name is Ben Murphy. I'm the assistant professor in studio art. Um, I primarily teach uh, all levels of drawing, including um, 2D design. So focus on um, drawing technique and fundamentals, um, uh, the tradition of drawing, um, what it is today, and I think also uh, searching for what drawing can be. Um, and within that, we're always sort of pushing and looking uh, for students to uh, translate their, their own experience um, and what's happening in the world around them into visual forms. Um, and, and so one of the things I do like to do is, is collaborate with other departments uh, when, when possible. And, and Chris, I have the other Chris, uh, Dr. Chris Drohan coming in next week. Um, in the past, he's talked about uh, the simulacra. Um, and next week, we're looking at signs and symbols. So this challenge for the students will be to respond um, to that lecture provided by the philosophy department. Um, and that's sort of um, sort of the foundation of uh, this particular upcoming project. So um, that's sort of an example of how I approach teaching, at least at the more advanced level, when we're starting to move away from technique and look uh, look uh, a little bit more closely at subject and content. Um, myself, um, I uh, I guess my practice. Uh, generally surrounds um, painting uh, for the most part and um, really sort of um, coming out of uh, abstraction and looking for ways to uh, pull in new contemporary signs and symbols uh, into the work to um, spark conversation about what's happening in the in the world around us. Um, so a couple things in this particular image we um, have on the left in red and yellow uh, is a double hurricane, two simultaneous hurricanes known as, as the Fujiwara effect. And uh, I like to incorporate uh, scientific data um, into those images. So in the background, uh, you can sort of see a 150 year um, recording of hurricane activity over time. Um, the yellow and purple is uh, a disappeared glacier from Iceland. And then uh, the smaller work uh, on uh, the far right there is <clears throat> um, really a, a work that uh, looks at color theory and tries to relate it to the functions of different neurotransmitters that are, are being explored in research today. Um, <clears throat> So I'm um, generally looking at uh, contemporary signs, symbols, how to integrate them with abstract painting, but also looking at um, new ways to approach the surface of, of image making. Uh, so I do look at digital fabrication um, to some extent uh, to try to come up with new surfaces um, um, you know, to to really sort of be the foundation of um, of the painting uh, or the structure of the painting. So in this case, I'm showing you a design for the semiconductor in the island of Taiwan, um, and this is sort of a uh, the CAD rendering of it. Um, and I use it for three D printing, which is sort of an additive type of machine drawing. And also I use CNC routing, which is sort of a reductive type of machine drawing. So here's an example of it, just sort of in production. Um, this particular one is uh, made up of four different panels uh, and is about six by seven feet. You can see sort of here, um, the process of assembling it. And then of course the, the finished, finished image. So. Um, this particular work calls to mind um, some uh, geopolitical tensions that are happening in the world right now between uh, China, China, the island of Taiwan, and of course, uh, stressing uh, US and 
uh, in China relations. It also references um, uh, globalism and sort of our our sort of recent retreat into more regional economies um, with the U.S. starting to build their own um, semiconductor manufacturing um, within the United States and, and regionally. Um, I also like to collaborate with scientists. Um, it's a way that I um, collect and respond to, to data that other people are, uh, that's driving other people's research. Uh, so I recently did a project with Dr. Barry and Moore. He's the director of the National Weather Center. And he'd seen a couple of my large format um, weather or climate-based paintings and invited me to do a piece for the National Weather Center. Um, so we talked about sort of what was important and he felt like um, one of the sort of the, the biggest or most alarming changes taking place on the planet right now is um, the reduction of ice uh, coverage in the Arctic. Um, so I did a, some research. I looked at data from this, uh, the Snow and Ice Institute in Colorado, as well as C3, which is the Copernic Copernicus uh, Climate Research Center in Europe. Um, so I'm, what you're seeing here is uh, the 1980 ice coverage uh, in the larger sort of shape and the um, 2020 ice coverage in that sort of central smaller shape. And the bar graph is the uh, mean surface temperature over that same 40 year period. Um, and so this is sort of the, the translation into color um, from left to right, um, warmer tones sort of start to take over more and more of, uh, of the image or the, the painting surface. Uh, and then now it's trans translated into a larger piece. Uh, this is the, the finished piece installed at the Weather Center. Um, this one was a little bit uh, um, complicated for me in terms of the actual um, putting together the painting surface. Uh, you'll notice there's a slightly curved wall there. So I created uh, a three panel laminated um, painting surface. Um, that was flexible enough to sort of curve with the wall upon installation. So um, I'm also sort of continuing this exploration of sort of climate driven um, uh, paintings that are based in um, in data collection. Um, my current project called uh, Hydrological Landscapes looks at areas uh, Within, within the world that are losing ice uh, and gaining land and other areas that are losing land and, and gaining water. Um, this is satellite imagery uh, of the Okikul Glacier, which is the first disappeared glacier in Iceland. Um, they held a funeral for it in 2019. Um, my large uh, painting here, um, reflects on that. It's called The Legend of Oak Gold, and it's based on the uh, 1986 footprint of the glacier. So recently, um, I was invited uh, by Dr. Simeen Howe, an anthropologist at Rice University. Um, she um, was instrumental in creating a monument for the Oak Gold Glacier. And she's going back for sort of the fifth anniversary um, of that event this summer. Um, they're going to be launching a glacier casualty list. And she also has glaciologists coming from around the world, from the Andes, from the Himalayas, and from Europe. Um, so I'll have a chance to meet and uh, get to know some of those scientists and hopefully um, make some connections where I can start to sort of engage with those uh, glaciologists research to produce um, and contribute to my hydrological landscapes project. Um, so I'll be traveling to Iceland in August to continue that research. I'll be going to the Okikul Memorial and um, visiting two other glacier sites um, that are quickly disappearing. And finally, I have a, another um, a solo exhibit um, this August, and the show focuses on 
uh, our changing understanding of how emotions are made. So I'm looking at the research of, uh, of Dr. Lisa Barrett. Um, she's a, a leading neuroscience and neuropsychologist. Um, so the show does a couple of things. It looks at um, neural networks. It looks at um, some of the ways that our brain constructs emotions based on um, the way you feel, your previous experience, and external stimuli. And I also um, try to equate color theory with um, some of the um, act activities or um, uh, uh, roles of neurotransmitters. So thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Stop sharing. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, and we now have our um, our final speaker, after which we'll have a few minutes, I think, for some questions. And um, that is Giovanni Francisco Salazar Calvo from Languages and Literatures. Can you all hear me? Yeah? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to hear all of these wonderful presentations and uh, I'm looking forward to hear more about them and to to possible future collaborations. And uh, now I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Can you see my my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Well, my name is Giovanni Salazar Calvo, as Jennifer was saying. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, sharing a little bit about my research and what I do here at OSU. I'm an assistant professor of Spanish with a specialization in Mexican literature in the Department of Languages and Literatures. Broadly, my, my research interests include colonial Latin American literatures and cultures, indigenous worldviews in Mesoamerica and the Andes, non-ordinary states of consciousness, psychoactive plants and ethnobotany, and the intertwining of religion and medicine along with a medical humanities. In particular, I focus on early modern studies, especially the transatlantic circulation of knowledge about medicine and religion, psychoactive plants and shamanism, among other vehicles of non-ordinary states of consciousness in Spain and in colonial uh, Mexico. I'm intrigued uh, about how native cosmologists and their insights about bodily, mental, and spiritual health appear in colonial literature, such as codices and conquest chronicles, and it stays relevant in contemporary Mexican cultural artifacts, especially literature, but also visual art. Regarding psychotropic plants, I have published the article, Those Who Eat Coca Are Sorcerers, Demonology and Coca in the Works of Guaman Poma de Vidala, in which I reflect about the ritual and medical uses of coca leaves in colonial Peru, along with the political implications of such consumption as portrayed in a 17th century indigenous chronicle. Regarding medical uh, humanities, my article, A Transvestite Lady Doctor, Humor and Subversion in Love the Doctor, 1635, by Tirso de Molina, studies how a 17th century Spanish play re-evaluates medical practices and the role of women in such assessment. I'm also currently working on a book manuscript about herbals and anti-superstitious treatises written in Spain and in colonial Mexico during the period of 1550 and 1650. I research how uh, these works of natural and moral history respectively intertwine European and native ideas about health and religion in medical practices entailing altered states of consciousness. 
I focus on the portrait of psychoactive pharmaca, such as datura, marijuana, peyote cactus, ololuki, and psychoactive mushrooms to observe how these images constitute cultural systems of social organization in which medicine is practiced. This book challenges the traditional separation between moral and natural histories by observing the attitude held by priests and doctors as well towards the phenomenon of inebriation among witches, sorcerers, medicine men, shamans, and indigenous communities in Spain, in colonial Mexico. Lastly, I have been invited to write an introduction in a preliminary critical study for Hipernatura, which is a collection of short stories written by members of Kipapacha, a collective of Peruvian authors that are concerned with Peruvian futurism in eco-fiction. In this work, I reflect on the role of human beings in a sustainable ecosystem in which plants engage in a symbiotic relationship with humans to generate peace. In that sense, uh, with this overview of, of my research, I can see a lot of possible connections with the research that my colleagues presenting today uh, are doing. And I look forward to, to, to inquire and learn more about these possible uh, connections. And uh, finally, I would like to share with you some of, of myself outside of academia, things that I enjoy doing uh, for fun, uh, some of my favorite hobbies. Uh, I love hiking with my wife and our dog Socrates, which you can see right there. I also play in the guitar. Love, uh, love the music a lot and cooking delicious food. So um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Muchas gracias. And it's been a pleasure to share a little bit of, of myself and what I do with you guys and learn a lot about what you guys do and, and who, what your work is here at OSU. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Giovanni. Um, okay, that uh, wraps up our introductions, but we have about 10 minutes left and we would very much like to open that up for questions. So does anyone have any questions for our speakers or if our speakers have questions for each other or the group as a whole, um, we invite them now. Right. Yeah, Priscilla. I have a basic question. It's more for you, Jen. Uh, with everybody, I really enjoyed listening to everyone's work. This was this was so much fun to be able to hear what everyone's doing. It's super interesting. So my question is, when um, the individual departments have any series, any lectures, um, Jennifer, do you get wind of that? Does, does that get posted in the Center for Humanities? Because well, I'd love have to, to be able to have to share it with us. So um, it does not happen seamlessly. Someone must make the decision to send me something. You can send it via email, but we also have a page that I'm sure Vera could uh, put up for us um, where you can uh, post either. Um, we have actually a couple of different places. You can either share info um, on events happening, or if you have ideas for speakers or events that um, we could run, you can also submit those suggestions. So um, that is the best path. Um, and she's going to put the link, but you can find it on our website to a place where you can um, upload events happening in your areas. Um, if they're connected to larger organizations such as, uh, or, or um, interdisciplinary groups like gender women's and sexuality studies or Africana studies. Some of those departments or programs have mailing lists that go out. And so I do sometimes hear about those through their own promotions. And when I find things that come across my desk in different ways, we are happy um, to move that into our communications. But we do, to ensure that it gets known, someone needs to send it to me. So I think it, it kind of is hit or miss and continues to, uh, be something that is a work in progress, but um, definitely something that we that we try to work on. 
So encourage everyone in your department. Yes, if you're giving yes. it to anyone, send it to Jennifer. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Or or post it on our um, on our website and we'll share it. Absolutely. Um, no, I think that that is very much part of our um, our goal with the creation of the center um, was to facilitate that kind of um, learning about what else is happening. Um, it's imperfect. Uh, it's a challenge, but I think um, it has improved and certainly has more room for improvement as well. Thank you for that question. Um, any other questions that folks have for the speakers? Uh, yes, Rachel. Thanks, this is, I don't know, sort of a minor one possibly, but for Chris, I would love to hear an example of um, how, I forget your phrasing exactly, but how symbolic logic can help or apply to other things. Oh, well, I mean, the, I'm interested in it in terms of helping us understand what good reasoning is mm -hmm. um, and just trying to get more precise about that. That's sort of a, a place that symbolic logic is, is really helpful. Yeah. But... Uh, philosophers often have science envy and we uh, <laughs> run away with our formalisms and think that they do the interesting work for us. So I'm also interested in the limits of that kind of like symbolization and formalization. Um, but there is actually some quite interesting work in like feminist philosophy of logic and thinking huh. about um, symbolization through a feminist lens, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay. I'm also really keen on, I'm just getting to teach for the first time um, symbolic logic to undergrads, which mm. I'm really passionate about because it's often a like it's a very scary course, yeah. and I want it not to be that. Um, yeah. for all sorts of reasons, but one is uh, I tell students on day one that you know learning symbolic logic is like learning to juggle or to ride a bike. It's developing a complex skill, and to get good at it, you have to fail a lot um, and be comfortable with that. And that's something that you know is useful for well, anyone. So yeah, those are a few quick things. Great. Thank you. Any other questions out there? I guess one other question that I could open up to everyone. I know some of you did talk a little bit about your um, teaching, but um, some of you did not. So if you wanted to add a little bit more about the teaching that you do, or, um, you know, I think especially if you're, if you teach classes that are um, are good for folks in other departments and students coming from other fields, that may be something that's um, useful to share with uh, this group as well. Yes, Giovanni. Um, in our department, we teach uh, different languages such as Spanish, German, classics, uh, so many different languages. In my case, I, I specialize in Spanish, Spanish language at all levels and literature and all sorts of cultural artifacts in the Hispanic world. Uh, currently I'm teaching a course in, in introduction to, to literary uh, analysis. And I'm also teaching a course on called the uh, Spanish for healthcare professionals or medical medical Spanish. And uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to be able to talk about all of these topics, but that many students have approached because they come from the healthcare professions, but in a totally new code, the code of, of Spanish. And uh, even though it can be sometimes very similar information to what they learn, when they change languages, everything changes. So it's been a, a wonderful experience. And uh, I think that many students can benefit from, from that. I just have a quick follow-up, which is, um, are those um, people who are, um, say, currently medical students, or are these people who are already in, the, in their professions who are kind of going back to learn this? Uh, well, there are some students that they are just in interest in interested in increasing their proficiency, mm -hmm. and uh, given that we read a lot and, and have a lot of conversations that help them to to learn more, and there's another group of students that 
are doing pre-med uh, coursework. So they are getting ready to enter into the, the medical professions. So this is a, a great review, review for them. And um, there's also other students in other scientific fields like biochemistry or other areas that can want to take advantage of the knowledge that they currently have in order to increase it and, and to be able to relate it to the classes that they are already taking. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything uh, about their teaching or, or anything else? We've got a couple minutes left. Any other questions for our audience? For our audience, from our audience. Amanda, you just switched. Uh, you have a question? Uh, maybe not so much a question as an invitation to some of our new faculty members. Uh, my name is Amanda Booth. I am currently an advisor over in the Honors College, um, and I will soon be the advising manager for our first year arts, humanities, social science, and education students. Um, but I wanted to extend an invitation to some of our new faculty here. It's been great hearing about everybody's research. Um, here in the Honors College, we have a series that we call um, Pizza with the Prof, and it gives our students a chance to meet uh, faculty members across campus and hear about your research, um, give a small presentation, kind of what you're doing, um, what you think is cool about it, um, and our students a chance to interact with you, ask you questions, and potentially get involved with things you've got going on. So um, if you're ever interested in doing that, contact the honors office um, and let them know and uh, they'll get you on the schedule. I think we do that about once a month um, and it's been pretty well attended by our students. So I'm always up for seeing more of our arts and humanities faculty um, getting more exposure with our honors students. And that's actually probably an invitation that extends to um, everybody, all, all faculty, not just the, the folks who spoke today. So yeah, right. thank you so much, Amanda. All right, well, I think with that, um, we will wrap up our event today, but I wanna thank again, all of our speakers for sharing their work and taking time today to do so. And also for all of you for attending. Um, and uh, again, you know where to find info for the center if you want to participate in more events. Um, reach out to us. We'd love to see you at um, some of the things coming up and um, thanks everyone for being here today and have a great rest of your week. <laughs>